Whoa, Mr. Ramon, Professor Ramon, and now with backgrounds and color, right? Snazzy? A little something extra. Let me know if you think it's cool or if it's stupid, if it distracts too much. I just figured you guys just got tired of looking at that same office while I got downstairs. So anyways, uh, this is your lecture for, or not lecture, rather, just your, your study partner video here for Chapter 26. This is uh, hypertension or drugs to control hypertension, HTN hypertension. Uh, we've kind of talked about hypertension already uh, in the chapters that we covered previously. So a lot of this should be kind of a repeat. We'll see how long this video turns out, but I'll give you a thorough review of it. So away we go. So um, chapter 26 starts on page 374. I'm um, on 375. And in fact, 374, let's look at some of the drugs at a glance we have up here. So we're going to be giving diuretics for hypertension, which makes sense, right? Because if there's a lot of water in the system and it's compressed, you want to open up the hose somewhere so that water can come out and then you drop the blood pressure. So we agree that blood volume equals blood pressure. An increase in blood volume equals an increase in blood pressure. A drop in blood volume can also, in turn, drop blood pressure. Does that make sense? Look how appropriate there's water behind me, right, for the conversation. Next thing, uh, again, drugs at a glance. Drugs affecting the renin-angiotensin system. Oh, well, they mean ACEs and ARBs. So the ACE inhibitors, remember, those all end in pril, and the ARBs, those end in TAN, like Losartan. Keep in mind, uh, angiotensin, no, the ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, prevent the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 inside the lungs. So no surprise that for the ACE inhibitors, uh, the main side effect that you want to educate and look out for is going to be a very dry cough. They usually complain of a little powder, <clears throat> but nothing ever comes up and it's very dry and I drink water, it won't go away. So you got to ask questions related to those kinds of symptoms. Uh, pardon me. When you uh, come across someone's, you know, they're bringing you their medications and you're doing a reconciliation and you see ACE inhibitor in there, that's what you should be asking, right? And the ARBs, those prevent uh, the angiotensin 2 from actually binding at the receptor side on the adrenal gland to release the aldosterone. Because we know that if aldosterone goes up, sodium goes up. Sodium goes up, water goes up. Water goes up, pressure goes up. And the same thing is vice versa. If aldosterone drops, then the sodium levels drop, then the water volume drops, then the blood pressure drops. You see that? So aldosterone and blood pressure are also a, 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 the same direction related. Aldosterone up, blood pressure up. Aldosterone down, blood pressure down. Does that make sense? So the next drugs that we're going to be talking about is calcium channel blockers. And um, we'll get into those because there's different types of them of different strengths and the whole bit. And then you've got your uh, adrenergic antagonists. So those are your alpha blockers and your beta blockers. Uh, beta blockers, those end in LOL. Alpha blockers, depends, right? Some of them end in SIN and some of them might end in RIDE. Mm, I'm not sure if the RIDE ones are actually alpha blockers. So we'll have to look at that. I think those are reductase inhibitors or something else. But we definitely know that the alpha blockers end in SIN. So SIN and LOL, yeah, the RIDES are something else altogether. That's for the prostate. And then the direct right vasodilators, dilators, and that's another thing that will affect blood pressure. So if a uh, blood vessel, the lumen, the size of the lumen, will equal a particular pressure. If this lumen gets smaller, the pressure increases. If this lumen gets bigger, the blood pressure drops. So do you see how vasodilation equals a drop in blood pressure and vasoconstriction equals an increase in blood pressure? So look at how there's two things that are actually working on blood pressure in general, the blood volume and the effects and the size of blood vessels. See where we're going with this? The pressure coming into the heart and the the resistance, of the pressure that's resisting whatever's coming out of the heart. Something's resisting it over here, and then there's a force of pushing into it. Preload, afterload, right? Good, good. So on page 375, right, there's the term hypertension, HTN. That's how we abbreviate hypertension instead of writing the whole thing up. I think it was in a previous chapter where we talked about two types of hypertension. No, it's in this one. Esen primary or essential as opposed to secondary, which else is on page 377 on the next page. 377 left hand side at the bottom. Two types of hypertension, primary hypertension or secondary hypertension, also known as essential and non-essential. So primary hypertension means 
it's genetic. It has nothing to do with the diet. It has nothing to do with um, uh, uh, smoke, cigarette smoking or stress or cholesterol in the blood vessels. It starts to make that lumen go smaller, therefore increase the pressure. So this is different. Essential or primary hypertension is more genetic. Mom had hypertension, dad had hypertension, you got hypertension, regardless of what you're eating or smoking, what have you see that. While secondary hypertension means secondary to what? So one of the common causes, look at down there, Cushing syndrome or hyperthyroidism. So hyperadrenalism or hyperthyroidism. Either the two can start to increase blood pressure. So good morning, California. Good. Graves disease, hyperthyroidism. This increases the metabolic rate. This might cause blood vessels to constrict a little bit and increase pressure, and then the heart rate's going faster. It's hyperthyroidism, Graves disease. G-M-C-A-C, -C, adrenal gland, up, Cushing syndrome. You see that? Cushing's, Cushing syndrome, too much adrenaline. So that's going to cause a sympathetic reaction, which causes blood vessels to constrict, which increases the blood pressure right there. So those would be secondary causes of blood pressure, of, hy of hypertension. Hyperthyroidism or hyperadrenalism, uh, Cushing's or Addison's. Other things might be secondary to cigarette smoking, secondary to extremely stressful jobs, secondary to cholesterol building up in the blood vessels, or back to diet, diet related, it, uh, related to salt in the diet. Keep in mind though that high blood pressure is, starts to crush the kidneys from the inside out, so don't forget the kidneys and all of this, because all of this we're just talking how to manage the blood pressure, but you should be thinking already that this high blood pressure is absolutely crushing the kidneys from the inside out. It's the silent killer, right? Silent, silent. Man. So renal panels would be important for somebody who's had a high blood pressure that's been unmanaged for an extended period of time. Consider that. Ooh, pretty. Look at that. I want to sit right there and drink a Bud Light with that. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I'm not. 375. So we have a uh, hypertension right there. And then it says factors responsible for blood pressure. I love that chart at the bottom because blood pressure in general, we still have to break it up into the components. There's the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic. So each one of those is going to have its bell curve for systolic and for diastolic, right? And I said systolic, usually above 90 because any systolic that's less than 90, it may not be enough pressure to push blood into the brain. So now you're getting altered LOC. Now, you got little petite grandma-sized people or petite you know, petite frames of people. A, a, a high 80s might be their normal systolic. That's not who I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the average person. Systolic, usually greater than 90, is needed for perfusion, proper perfusion of the kidney and the brains. Now, when the blood pressure goes too low is another story, but this chapter here is talking about high blood pressure, too high. So once you start seeing 180, 190, 200, 210, holy smoke. You got to not just treat the number, look at the patient, because you can't just call the doctor and say, she's got a blood pressure of 200 over 100. He's going to ask you, and you have to say symptomatic or asymptomatic. Asymptomatic, you might say, monitor, give her a diuretic, and give me a call if she develops a headache. But symptomatic will be 200 over 100 and a pounding headache. She says it's the worst headache of her life. She's about to have an aneurysm. So consider symptomatic or asymptomatic along with the number that you're seeing systolic too high. Diastolic, eh, we look at it, but it's really about the systolic. And remember, these two pressures, one is higher and one is lower. The diastolic will never be higher than the systolic, never. Because you're measuring two pressures, one when the heart is contracted and one when the heart is relaxed. Because the entire body is a closed system. So if you squeeze this part of the system, it's going to increase the pressure on everything. And then you relax it, it relaxes the pressure on everything. It's a closed system, the heart and all of the blood vessels. So therefore, you have a normal compressed blood pressure and an uncompressed blood pressure, a systolic and a diastolic. But we're worried here about the systolic being too high, 190, 200, 210, symptomatic. Ah, emergency. We got to get this down. You see that? That's what we're going with. So look at the picture down at the bottom of 375, blood pressure. Three things make up the normal blood pressure. That's systolic and diastolic we're talking about. Number one, blood volume. How much water is there in the system? And look at the components that will affect the blood pressure. Either fluid retention increases in blood pressure or fluid loss decreases in blood pressure. So decrease in blood pressure, dehydration, sweating, no available water. You see that? Look at the fluid retention, aldosterone, because we said if aldosterone goes up, you hold on to sodium, you hold on to water, you increase the pressure. Or antidiuretic hormone, 
uh, ADH is in the brain, is a hormone up in the brain that f affects the collector ducts. So ADH and aldosterone technically do the same, not the same thing. They both increase pressure, but ADH holds back water at the kidneys while aldosterone holds back sodium at the kidneys, which in turn holds back water. So these two together in certain amounts are the ones that are responsible for keeping the blood pressure greater than 90, but not too much higher. Too much higher would be either because of an essential cause, right? Genetics or a non-essential, a secondary cause, which is something else is causing it. Does that make sense? So look at the middle, but that's blood volume. The middle one says vas uh, peripheral resistance of the diameter of the arterioles. Not the veins, the arteries. Big difference between an artery and a vein is that the artery actually has a tunica media, the inner part. That's the meaty part. Veins have a very thin one. The tunica media on the arteries is what gives it the ability to be able to vasodilate and constrict because all of that tunica media has its own nerve and each one of those nerves is connected to the brain and in the brain, sympathetic reactions. So sympathetic nervous system kicks in, vasoconstrict, increase the pressure, run away from the from Tyrannosaurus Rex or the IRS, right? Stress is stress. It doesn't matter what it is. Your body's going to respond to stress the same way, whether it's physiological, psychological, same, same stress, right? So that's why under this peripheral resistance, because now the blood is leaving the heart, and it can go faster if the blood vessel was wider. But even if the blood vessel is at maximum wideness, all of, there's still some resistance from all the blood coming from the preload into the heart and out of the heart. So there's only so fast it's going to be able to leave, even if the blood vessels and the arteries after the heart are completely dilated. There's still a resistance. That resistance is called afterload. You get it? So there's a normal range for an afterload, just like there's a normal range for a preload. You see that? So here it says for the peripheral resistance, sympathetic uh, nervous system activity, epinephrine, norepinephrine, Renin angiotensin system, you mean aldosterone, same thing, right? And then increases in blood viscosity. So I didn't tell you this, but another thing that aldosterone does, it also affects blood vessels just a little bit, but it's not its primary function. Its primary function is to retain sodium in the kidney, therefore retaining water, therefore increasing pressure, right? So, yeah, you increase the viscosity of blood as well. Or the in or increases in viscosity of blood will also cause problems with circulation, periphery which means dehydration for the most part. Look at the third one, cardiac output. And you got a formula, stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output. Stroke volume, set number for males and females because there's two sizes of heart, the male heart and the female heart on average. It's not an exact science, right? Then the other one is the heart rate. How do you do a heart rate? You take a pulse. So that's set number for male and female. The stroke, the, the, the pulse, Multiplied together gives you cardiac output. And what is cardiac output up at the pod, top of 375? Cardiac output, the volume of blood pumped per minute is a cardiac output. So in one minute, how much blood is coming out of your heart? Depends on how fast it's beating and then the size of the heart. Does that make sense? Yeah. So turn the page and then it gives you a little bit of an overview down at the bottom of how blood pressure is regulated. That's a nice little algorithm. Look at how the blood pressure goes up. Compensation by the cardiac system is going to pump faster and compensation by the kidneys. So this is normal physiology at the bottom of 376. Your blood pressure shoots up too high, higher than the 110, 120 over 80. Too high on the first number. Maybe you're already hitting with a 190 mark. You see that? Uh-oh. So what does your body do normal function to bring that pressure back down a little bit? Two things. Boom. It affects the heart and the kidneys. At the kidneys, easy peasy. It sends a message to the blood pressure, the vasoreceptors on the blood vessels. When they start to stretch, that sends a message saying overstretch. And that overstretch sends a message to the kidney, which then tells it to stop the renin. You see that? So no more aldosterone. Stop the ADH, so no more ADH. Start the dump water and sodium, see that? So the urine output increases on the box, and right below there, the blood volume decreases, and then what happens? The blood pressure comes back to normal. So sometimes your body just takes that route and controls the pressure, and it dumps water into the bladder, and it just saves it there. And once the bladder is full enough, then you get the urge to go to the restroom and urinate. Make sense? 30 cc's per hour, normal filtration of the kidney. Uh, but let's take the other route. Blood pressure increases. Let's not go to the kidney. Let's go the other way, the heart. 
So compensation by the cardiac system kicks in. What kind of comp compensation? Three things. Number one, there's going to be the blood pressure is too high. So it's going to, in some areas, try to vasodilate to decrease some of that pressure. That might be enough. This it will also decrease stroke volume. How do you do that? It slows down the heart rate. So look at that. The heart rate slows down. That means the stroke volume slows down. That means the cardiac output goes down. You see that? So again, this could be part of turning off the sympathetic nervous system, yeah, or increasing the acetylcholine to relax, relax cardiac output, decrease it. And now cardiac output comes down, the blood pressure comes back to normal. Both of those combined, your blood pressure, this is how your blood pressure is normally maintained for the most part. But there are other chemicals because we talk atrial natriuretic peptide and brain natriuretic peptide, which do pretty much the same thing as aldosterone does. Except one of them, brain natriuretic peptide, is to keeping an eye on the on the brain blood vessels, and the atrial natriuretic peptide is keeping an eye on cardiac, uh, atrial, atrial uh, tissues that are overstretching. You see that? Anyways, so great conversation there. Uh, we know these terms already, so we already know chemoreceptors, antidiuretic hormone, angiotensin receptor, and aldosterone system. We know that they've got that. Primary and secondary. Types of hypertension, turn the page, 378, non-pharmacological management of hypertension. We must not always automatically reach for a drug to try to solve every single problem. Sometimes we need to modify the lifestyle or behaviors to control the physiology. If that can be done, all the better. No adverse effects, no side effects. You see that? But once you reach for a drug, there's going to be a side effect. Now, you need to get things moving along faster. There's no time to modify the, the, the lifestyle. This is a critical blood pressure. Oh, absolutely, drugs, for sure. Now, you get somebody on drugs to control blood pressure. The name of the game should be, here's these drugs to control the blood pressure while you modify the lifestyle. Get the lifestyle modified, and once that is in place, get off of the drugs altogether. So drugs are not safe. None of these drugs are safe. They all have side effects. And there's a drug for that side effect as well. See, there's a drug for that too. So, look at some of the bullet points that I'm going to pop into the test. You should know and educate patients on limiting the amount of alcohol because alcohol is also uh, contributes to blood vessel damage, increases in cholesterol, liver damage, and all of that can play into increases in blood pressure over time. Restrict sodium consumption. Uh, at re restrict, really, you, it'd be best if you don't add salt to things because everything already has salt. If you're eating out and you didn't cook it at home, you bought it at a store, guaranteed it has too much sodium in it. It has to taste good because they have to sell it. They have to sell it, so it has to taste good. And the only way you're going to make it taste good is to spice it up really good. So don't trust any food from restaurants to, that they're going to be low salt unless they specifically specify, right? Uh, canned food is part of a high salt diet. Anything that's canned food, processed meats, cold cuts, that's going to be high salt as well. So you're looking at sodium restriction. Canned foods, you have to. It has to say no salt added. It has to say on there, because there's green beans in a can, and then there's green beans no salt added. That's the one you want to promote for patients to use, right? Look at the next one. Reduce the intake of saturated fat. You're back to cholesterol that starts to collect in the blood vessels, and now you're you're shrinking the lumen, which means you're increasing the blood pressure, right? And then what else do we have? Increase aerobic physical activity. Say twice a week. You should have a little bit of a physical activity and break a sweat. At least twice a week is usually what's recommended. Now, how much is it? Never tell somebody to start running. Well, just start jogging, you know, and then they do it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and they end up dying of heat stroke and they did it because you, you told them to. So you have to be careful. You need to consult with your doctor, but it is recommended that people exercise at least twice, two to three times a week to increase the heart rate beyond normal for at least 30 minutes. That's, that's the recommendation. But you should talk to your doctor about the right type of physical activity that is good, right for you. That's the what you say, right? Look at the next one. Discontinue the use of tobacco products. No benefit of smoking tobacco at all. At all, at all, at all, at all. The only patients that do get nicotine prescribed to them is Tourette syndrome. And I'm sure there's some other acetylcholine problems out there that require nicotine. But for the most part, Tourette syndrome is one of the few. It controls some of those tics. But in this case... But then does, the, does that mean that the Tourette syndrome patient is going to be at increased risk for cholesterol and blood vessel damage and high blood pressure? Yeah, absolutely. It's the lesser of two evils. Look at the next one. Reduce sources of stress. Good luck if you've got jobs, certain jobs, right? But uh, stress is a big one. The reason is because stress increases epinephrine and norepinephrine. And norepinephrine uh, and epinephrine 
cause vasoconstriction, and vasoconstriction increases the blood pressure. So stress is a big one. So you need a, a scenery like this. So you get a relax. You see that? Look at that. Um, or you can fly through the air like super remote. Look at that. Flying through the air. Anyhow, so let's control this blood pressure. We've got a ton of drugs that we can use for it. And there's a variety of things that we can do in combination as well. So look at how we have first-line classes of drugs for hypertension and uh, second-line drugs. 378, table 26.1. Down at the bottom, you should know the first-line drugs, which is ACEs, ARBs, calcium channel blockers, and thiazide diuretics. Can you pick this out? If I make a test question that has four options, says, which of the following is, which of the following is not uh, first-line uh, diuretic treatment for uh, essential hypertension, or for just hypertension, first-line drug. So we know that the ACEs are going to be the ones that end in pril, ARBs end in TAN, uh, calcium channel blockers, verapamil is one, what's another one, nifedipine, those have different names. So we'll look at those because they have different uh, applications as well. Look at your second line drugs. Ah, the alpha blockers, the beta blockers. You see that? The vasodil dilators and some of the renin inhibitors. Direct, direct renin inhibitor that affects the kidney, not this angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. It hits it much closer to the actual uh, source of the renin to control the blood pressure. Yeah. And then you got a great box that kind of summarizes all of them there on page 379. For time's sake, I'll let you read that one on your own. Um, so the first thing that we're going to be giving is uh, talking about is diuretics. So I know we've talked a few diuretics before. We talked uh, furosemide, Lasix, loop diuretic. Makes you dump everything. Sodium, potassium, magnesium, a little bit. So pot potassium is a particular concern when you're using uh, loop diuretics like furosemide or bumetadine or furosemide. There's only three. But furosemide is usually the most popular one. Remember Lasix, furosemide, one milligram IV usually equals one cc. And the rule of thumb is one cc per minute, one milligram per minute. So if they say 10 milligrams of Lasix in the morning, that's 10 minutes you're going to take IV to give it. Not only that, is it going to be first thing in the morning? Absolutely, because it's a diuretic. If you give a diuretic later in the day, ooh, they, they, later in the day, they'll be getting up all night. So you're causing the potential for a fall. So that's anti-nurse. You're supposed to prevent falls, not potential for falls. So of course now we would give a diuretic early in the morning. Why? Safety. Fall, fall, fall precautions. You see that? So here the diuretic that we're going to be talking about in particularly that's new is the hydrochlorothiazide diuretics. And look at how the thiazide, which is hydrochlorothiazide. And look on page 380, table 26.2. All of those are combinations of hydrochlorothiazide and something else. So do you, are you expected to know all of these? No, just know that hydrochlorothiazide can be mixed with any one of these other drugs uh, and common to, to, to uh, control blood pressure. And if you look, it means that it's a first-line drug. So a thiazide diuretic plus any one of the other three you might see as a first-line drug to control hypertension, right? However, you got some other diuretics here on this list on 381. Potassium sparing, spironolactone. You should know that one. Page 351. Away we go. 351, 351, 351. Spironolactone. This is a potassium sparing diabetic. It's diuretic diabetic. 351. Potassium sparing diuretic. You see that? Yeah. Uh, aldosterone antagonist. You see that? Yeah. So look at what else, spironolactone, frequently prescribed potassium sparing diuretic, is primarily used to treat mild hypertension, often in combination with an antihypertensive, may be used to reduce edema uh, with, uh, with kidney or liver, associated with kidney or liver disease as well, uh, and shows progress in heart failure. Down at the bottom, it just says, do not give with potassium because it's a potassium sparing diuretic. So if I give you aldactone and then I give you potassium, man, your potassium is going to shoot through the roof. So, yes, of course, ad administration alert, don't give it with potassium. It's already a potassium-sparing diuretic. You're going to make it go up. Either way, get a potassium level, right? Spironolactone uh, does an efficient job at retaining potassium, so watch out with potassium levels. They may want to do a potassium level after a dose of spironolactone, like maybe 10, 12 hours later, 8 hours later. Black box warning, check it out, because it has been known to cause tumors. 
So you, there's a lot of concern with this drug with causing cancers altogether. So uh, that's the main thing you need to know about that one. Hop back to 381. Down at the bottom, thiazide diuretic. And then it says, see page 350 for your prototype drug. 350, 350. And it's hydrochlorothiazide. 350. So this drug you need to know as well. Hydrochlorothiazide. And it says thiazide diuretic. Most widely used prescribed diuretic for hypertension, like many diuretics, few serious adverse effects, 10 to 20 milligrams of blood pressure can drop. That's the effect of it. Patients with severe hypertension or a compelling condition may require additional, a second form of the drug class uh, to control the disease. So a little bit further down, next paragraph, acts on the kidney tubules to decrease the absorption of sodium. And therefore, you dump 99% of the sodium entering the kidney is reabsorbed. Yeah, yeah, reabsorbed, which means you get rid of it. You get rid of sodium on purpose with the thiazide, and then the water follows it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're concerned with all of the diuretics as well is drops in blood pressure and orthostatic hypertension. And then remember, all the diuretics are given first thing in the morning to prevent all that. Back to 381, down at the bottom, loop diuretics, there they are, dumetidine, furosemide, terosemide, Lasix, page 348, 348, Lasix, let's see whether there's anything in particular, Lasix also ringing in the ears, ringing in the ears, it could also cause that as well, Lasix, furosemide, page 348, loop diuretic, furosemide often used in the treatment of acute heart failure, because it has the ability to move large amounts of water, or excess fluid in a short amount of time. I, when given IV in five minutes, look at that, acts by preventing reabsorption of sodium. See that? So out goes the sodium, out goes the water as well, down in the loop of Henley, at the, down at, way at the bottom. So uh, black box warning, potent diuretic. Uh, watch out that it doesn't work a little too well, and now you've got an electrolyte depletion. So if you start having cardiac dysrhythmias after a pretty heavy dose of Lasix, already got an electrolyte imbalance. So all of these diuretics, when we're using them for acute conditions, Foley. You need a Foley because how can you confirm that it actually worked and you can say exactly how much fluid you got out of them? Sure, the daily weight, but you have INOs as well on the regular shift as well. Uh, Foley, you need to see how much fluid is coming out of them. So those are your different types of diuretics you need to know. Page 349, there they are. Spironolactone. No, I'm sorry. Did I jump somewhere else? No, I'm sorry. Whoops, 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 whoops. 381, 381. So there's potassium sparing, L-dactone, spironolactone, thiazide, hydrochlorothiazide, loop diuretic, furosemide. Then it gets into the ACEs and ARBs, and that whole story of renin plus angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 into the lungs plus surfactant, angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 hits the adrenal gland, release aldosterone. Aldosterone up, sodium up, water up, blood pressure up, shut off aldosterone, negative feedback mechanism. So all of that can also be derived on page 382 with figure 26.4. I just pretty much said all of that. And review the videos because angiotensin, this is AMP also. So I'm just refreshing you from stuff you knew from the AMP already. You already know. So uh, let's see, but ACEs and ARBs on page 383, enalapril is going to be the ACE inhibitor you need to know. And down for the angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, let's pick one, losartan. Losartan, go ahead and circle that one, losartan, also known as COZAR. So I'm going to see if you can be able to tell the difference between an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. For the ACE inhibitor, enalapril, following page, there it is, enalapril, prototype drug, ACE inhibitor, one of the most frequently prescribed ACE inhibitors for hypertension. Unlike captopril, the first ACE inhibitor marketed, enalapril has a longer half-life, prolonged half-life, so it lasts longer, and that's a good thing, less, less pills, instead yeah, so of three times a day, twice a day, or, or once a day. However, administration alert, first dose phenomenon, highlight that, resulting in a profound hyper profound hypotension, the blood pressure drops, and then you get dizzy and you pass out. You see that? So that's with enalapril, first dose phenomenon. I like that. So if it's the first time that they're going to take it, make sure they're laying down in bed or sitting down. First couple of times, I would say, right? Uh, black box warning is not for pregnant women. Uh, that's the main thing you need to know from that right there. 
And then down at the bottom, calcium channel blockers, there's your box table 26.5. Look at all of these earlier. Yeah, nifedipine, and lotopine. Yeah, uh, stick with nifedipine. That's going to be our, our, our uh, calcium channel blocker we're going to focus on. Uh, hepatotoxicity. However, look at the other two down at the bottom that are non-selective. So we have a selective calcium channel blockers and non-selective calcium channel blockers. If you remember that from the lecture from when we first had. So nifedipine is going to be the selective. What do we mean by that? So up at the top, calcium channel blocker for hypertension. It says nifedipine, calcium channel blocker, CCB, generally prescribed for hypertension, uh, for basal spastic angina. Plastic, basospastic angina. I felt spastic. It is occasionally used to treat Raynaud's phenomenon. You see that? That's uh, blood vessel problems in the hands. Nifedipine, it says, acts by selectively, because look at what it said, is it selective as opposed to non selective, selectively blocking calcium channels in myocardium and blood vessels. So that's what it does to vasodilate. You see that? And to affect heart tissue to slow things down. The result is lexal oxygen utilization. An increase in cardiac output because it slows down the heart so it could fill up better. So this is for fast dysrhythmias. It slows it down. You see that? And a, and a fall in blood pressure by causing vasodilation. So this is your calcium channel blocker non-selective. Because we have one of them that says is selective, right? So let's take a look at that. What's with the selective ones? We have diltiazem and verapamil. Let's look at both of them. Diltiazem, 423. Diltiazem 423, non selective 423. Oops, I'm on the wrong side of the page. 423, 423, diltiazem, cardizem, calcium channel blocker. It says has the ability to relax both coronary blood vessels and peripheral blood vessels, bringing more oxygen to the myocardium. Useful in the treatment of atrial dysrhythmias, hypertension as well as stable and vasoplastic angina. Diltiazem is available in IV route, etc. And then it just says, uh, that's all it says. It's uh, that's the main thing. Overdose, ah, highlight that. You need to know that. So if I'm giving you a calcium channel blocker, I'm going to slow down the heart too much. I need to speed you back up. So look at what we give as treatment for overdose. Artificial adrenaline. You see that? Isoprotanol. Or decrease the relax with an anticholinergic atropine. That's a test question right there. That's a good That's a good one for a test question. Diltiazem. But selective for what? Let's back it up. If diltiazem is non-selective, it says. Page 383, calcium channel blockers, exerted effect, blocks calcium ions, I figured. And then it says, contractions, two Calcium channel blockers are used to treat patients who present with serious life-threatening hypertension. That's at the bottom of 383 on the right-hand side. And it says, ultra-short and short-acting. That's not what I'm looking for. I wanted to see why. What is selected? Right above that. The paragraph right above that. Contraction of muscle is regulated by the amount of calcium in the ion. Muscular contractions occur when calcium ions enter the cell. Contract. So when you don't let calcium go in with a calcium channel blocker, the heart does not contract, so you slow it down. You vasodilate. You see that? And it says, uh, calcium channel blockers block these channels by inhibiting calcium from entering the cell, limiting contraction. A low dose relaxes arterial smooth muscle, thus lowering peripheral resistance. Ah, so they decrease uh, uh, afterload. Afterload, afterload. Some calcium channel blockers are selective for calcium in arterioles, whereas others, like verapamil, affect channels in both arteries and the cardiac tissue. There you go. So when we say on page, the, the following page, calcium channel blockers, table 26.5, selective and non-selective. Selective for what? Selective is going to be just cardiac tissue. But then how can this one say the same thing? I don't understand. Both arterioles and selected you know, for arterioles. Oh, selective arterioles, which is going to be nifedipine. Non-selective arterioles and the heart to slow down the heart rate in addition to slow or opening up blood vessels. So I can see where diltiazem and verapamil are for more for heart problems, cardiac output problems, and high blood pressure. You see that? 
So the heart, the, you see that? And the other one, the nephedipine is more directly for high blood pressure and blood vessels. That's how I understand that right there. So turn the page, and then we still have the adrenergic, adrenergic antagonists, the blockers, alpha blockers, beta blockers. And there you go. Look at all your beta blockers. LOL, 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 LOL. You've got one, two, three, four of them that are, could be potential drugs on the test. So what do they all have in common? A granulocytosis. A granulocytosis is a potential adverse effect for all of them, which means white blood cell counts go down, which means fevers go up, except for older, older patients, they get altered LOC. Uh, also, yeah, don't give them if the heart rate is too low. Yeah, those are all things to consider. Uh, so I'm just going to keep it general since there's too many of them on there. And then down at the bottom, the alpha adrenergic is the SIN, SIN. Yeah, SIN in this case, doxysosin, and that's on page 156. Let's go check that out. Oops, I just missed it. 156. Prazosin. Yeah, it's an antihypertensive. How it blocks epinephrine and norepinephrine. So that's what it does. You see that? So prazosin, selective alpha adrenergic and antagonist. Uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Yeah, but at the but at the wherever there is an alpha receptor. Major action is rapid decrease in peripheral resistance and reduces blood pressure. So this is also for afterload. So make sure you tell me all of these drugs. Keep an eye on which ones are preload or afterload because I could ask a question of which of the following is afterload or preload. It says tolerance to prezosin antihypertensive effects may occur, most common in the combination with other drugs. Highlight that. So tolerance can occur for this drug. And then let's see what we have. First dose should be very low and given at bedtime. Well, we're back to that first dose phenomenon. You see that? And then here's another one down for the treatment of overdose. Uh, overdose may cause hypotension, so you're just going to treat blood pressure. Anybody, Anytime somebody's blood pressure drops too low, it's a matter of giving in, uh, something to vasoconstrict or IV fluids to increase pressure. You see that? So cool, cool. That's that one. And then which is our other drug that we had on here that also had? The prototype drug, doxysosin, that's it, that was the only one there, cool, good, 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 and uh, 56, and then, so it gave it to you as two different types, it's the same drug, look at how it says doxysosin, and you have it as a prototype drug right here on page 387, Yet it sent us to 156. So look at the two drugs. 156, prazosin. 387, doxysosin. Two different forms of the same drug. See that? Except two different brand names for it. Alpha adrenergic blocker, alpha adrenergic blocking drug. Both of them the same. Look at that. So... Here, where the doxysosin, it says, the selective, uh, I'm looking for primary use. And it says, the doxysosin dilates arteries and veins, capable of causing rapid fall in blood pressure. Doxysosin, uh, several other adrenergic blockers, also relax smooth muscles of the prostate. Okay? But if we hop over to the one on page 156, prazosin, doxysosin, this is more for blood Pressure, selective use receptors. The major action is rapid decrease in peripheral resistance of blood pressure. Same drug, two different forms. That's interesting. I never noticed that. I always thought there were two separate drugs. Too, but I'm learning as I go along here too. Just goes to show that even with your nursing career so many years, man, you miss little details. Here. Now, I should turn on the AC. Look at that. I'm sweating. I'm getting all shiny. Sorry about that. It's a little warm in here. So let's see, turn the page. We also have 388 of direct vasodilators, and this is hydrozoline right there. So hydrozoline is your drug of choice. This is uh, for hypertension. This is a direct vasodilator. It doesn't affect sodium. doesn't affect renin angiotensin. doesn't affect the receptors in the heart and in the lung. No, it's just directly right into the blood vessels. That's why it says direct acting vasodilator. And it says, hydrozoline was once one of the first oral hypertensive drugs. It acts through a direct vasodilation of arterial smooth muscle. That's afterload. And then it says, therapy has begun with low doses, gradually increased until the desired therapeutic response is obtained. Several months of therapy are required uh, during your dosing. They're trying to figure it out, right? Parental formulations do exist for emergency hypertension emergencies. Hi I like that. 
This is the drug of choice for a medical emergency. High blood pressure, give them this, it will drop the water quickly. No, it opens up the blood vessels to drop it, and then you're giving a diuretic at the same time. Relatively recent use of the drug for BIDIL, a fixed dose combination, is BIDIL, is a fixed dose combination of the drug with a little bit of the isosorbid dinitrite. And then it says this combination is given to treat heart failure in African Americans who appear to show enhanced responses to the medication's progression. Look at that. So it's very good. It works very well for African Americans who tend to have a high blood pressure because of a salt sensitivity. Yeah, there is a salt sen sensitivity that's genetically there. Because of its effects on the heart, contraindicated with patients with angina, rheumatic heart disease, or any kinds of tachycardias. So there's your hydrolazine. That's another. So there's emergency emergency drop of blood pressure, right? Although you could also give that nitroposide as well. That was your whole chapter. About 45 minutes, I got it under, right? Alrighty, guys. So uh, let me load this up. We'll see you at the next video. Bye. I was going to walk off into the forest back here. All right. Take it easy. Oh, for crying out loud. My mouse is upside down. Bye-bye.